he speaks about sorcerer with a knowledge that it was coming at the end of the Vietnam era, that it represented something. And to him, I think sorcerer probably in the final years of his life, he, pro he, he continued to stand behind this idea for sorcerer. And he probably felt it even more with the war in Ukraine, which is, you know, he saw these four characters coming together in his adaptation of the wages of fear as people who had to get in those trucks and drive that nitroglycerin to the oil well in order to stop the flames in order to stop it and, and prevent the continued pollution and everything that was going on with the disaster that you see in the sorcerer or it's part of the wages of fear story with the, the oil that is just spewing like a geyser. You can't stop it. And those four men that have, uh, you know, have nowhere to go but to take this job to try and escape. They are in it together. And to him, that represented the crises and catastrophes of the world and everything that the world's coming apart. It seems all these powers, powerful countries, can either work together and try to deal with those issues or else they're all going to lose. They're all, everyone's going to, in some way or another, find that their fate is wrapped up in working together or else they're going to suffer and they might not even survive because they haven't found a way to cooperate. And in the film, the metaphor is of course, getting the nitroglycerin to stop that oil from polluting. So I think powerful metaphor for where we are right now, as the United States insists on a cold war of challenging China of countering Russia, of U.S. NATO countering Russia, um, you know these powerful countries that we have to cast as our enemies, um, and then there are issues that are bigger than us that we could take on, and you see that in the, in Sorcerer, it, it effectively becomes a kind of parable for global crises. All right, so this film that he makes that he works on. Let me show it to you, and then we will conclude the broadcast. Got this from WTF with Mark Marin from, I think, seven years ago. And on a Friday night, she had people from all walks of life. Lenny Bruce. And so what he's describing here, let me give you a little intro because I've started it. It's about five or six minute clip here. And what you're hearing is him talking about going to a party and running into a priest who, and this is in Chicago, it's in the Gold Coast, it's a very rich, upscale part of the city. You don't live there unless you have millions of dollars to get your hands on a piece of real estate where you can live. And you got the view of Lake Michigan. So uh, he, he was there with um, so hundreds of people, and many of them are known entities, and he, he gets an idea for his first documentary. Used to go there and Oscar Brown Jr. and uh, Alderman from Chicago, uh, Dr. Bergen Evans of Northwestern University's uh, English department. So she was putting together like these dinner salons almost where you engage in conversation. hundred people, yeah. oh, big salons, yeah. Yeah. massive yeah. with food and drink. Right. And one day I found myself squeezed against a corner. I went there yeah. finally. Yeah. And there were a hundred odd people around. And I'm standing next to a priest, a guy in a priest collar. Yeah. And I'm holding a drink, and he's holding a drink. And I didn't know what to say to him, but yeah. I just I just blurted out, Father, um, wh where is your church? And he said, oh, I don't have a church. He said, um, I'm the Protestant chaplain at the Cook County Jail on death row. And uh, I said, oh. Uh, and I instinctively, I said, have you ever met anybody on death row that you thought was innocent? And he said, yeah, there's a guy now, a black guy who's uh, 32 years old. He's been in for nine years. He's up for first degree murder. And both the warden and I think that he was beaten to confess by the Chicago cops. And I, it just went right through me. And I thought about this conversation. His name was Father Robert Surfling. Mm -hmm. And 
I thought about this conversation all weekend, and I called him at the Cook County Jail on a Monday morning. I said, Father, you remember me? He said, yeah, we talked at Lois Solomon's house. I said, could I meet this guy whose name was Paul Crump, Mm -hmm. Mm C-R-U-M-P? He said, well, why would you want to meet him? I said, I I don't know, but I said, I work in television, and I might be able to do him some good. He said, you can't do him any good. His All of his appeals have been denied. He was denied twice by the United States Supreme Court. He was denied certiorari, which meant that the court would take his case. The court denied hearing his case twice by one vote, five to four against. He's finished. The only thing that could save him is a pardon from the governor, who was then Otto Kerner. Democratic governor. Yeah. And I thought, I said, well, look, I don't know, maybe I could get his story in front of the public and something could happen. And he said, let me ask the warden. Now, the warden was a guy named Jack Johnson. Yeah. A big, heavy set bull of a guy who had executed three people in the electric chair and did not want to execute anyone else. And he liked Paul Crump. And he felt that Crump had become rehabilitated in prison, and he may not have been guilty in the first place. So he let me come down and meet him, meet Crump, and I went to the television station where I worked. I totally believed in Crump's story, as did many others. And I went to the TV station, and the general manager said, we don't make documentaries. We do live television. We don't want to do a documentary film. And so I went across town to the ABC station, which was Channel 7 in Chicago, run by a man called Red Quinlan, Mm -hmm. who had wanted to hire me. But I stayed at WGN because I was doing the Chicago Symphony Orchestra program live. And that was a great experience uh, at WGN. So I stayed there, but Quinlan financed a 16 millimeter documentary that I made with another guy who was a live TV cameraman named Bill Butler, Uh who later was the cameraman, the director of photography on Jaws, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Uh a number of other great films. But he and I started together and we learned by rote how to make a film. We had access to Death Row and I, I knew nothing about how to make a documentary. I had never seen one. Yeah. But I was motivated to make this film as a kind of court of last resort for this guy. Yeah. We made this film. It w- it's very primitive, whatever, but it was shown to the governor of Illinois, Otto Kerner, uh-huh. and he sent me a note. And the note said, I've seen your documentary And though my parole and pardon board has voted two to one to send Mr. Crump to the electric chair, I'm going to pardon him to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. And that was uh, a first. I mean, it had happened once before that I'm aware of in Chicago, the Loeb-Leopold case. Right. Where Clarence Darrow defended Loeb and Leopold, and they got life imprisonment instead of the chair. They were kids, teenagers. Anyway, the film saved this man's life, and Red Quinlan then entered it in a whole bunch of film festivals where it won uh, the best, not only best documentary, but best film. It won the Golden Gate Award at the San Francisco Film Festival in 1960. Uh, Has that thing been re-released? It's been re-released. It's out there. What's it called? The People versus Paul Crump. But it saved this gentleman's life, and I thought, my God, the power of film. Right. What you can do with film? Yeah. And then I had offers to come out to Hollywood to do documentaries. And I came out to California in 1965. So that's mid-60s, and I suppose the civil rights movement is at its peak and he's making this movie and how about we take a look at it here so this is the trailer for that movie the people versus paul crump 
At the time I undertook the defense of Paul Crump and talked to him, I thought he was innocent. During the defense of this case, I thought he was innocent. When we went up to the Supreme Court, I thought he was innocent. And frankly, I still think he's innocent. The only thing they wanted was a conviction. They got the conviction, and that's it. They got the conviction, Paul, and now you're sitting in the Cook County Jail waiting execution. Yeah. How many times have you been up to within a day or two? No, I've lost count. I don't even like to think about it. <laughs> Our Civilizations Act in Killing Crawl. Early 60s bebop jazz There's soundtrack. To, to our traditions. Uh, of, of decency and civility, uh, then Crump's act, if he did it, uh, in killing that guard. Now, that's a fact. And the reason it's a fact is because this killing is done in cold blood. And so as he's doing this movie, he's developing a style for the filmmaking that he'll do in the early 70s. He's he's cutting his teeth on having these opportunities. And without them, we don't probably get the classic films that are the French Connection and uh, probably doesn't uh, lead to The Exorcist. And and so there's uh, I'm always interested in hearing about the first time films that these big directors have done especially when they're low budget and have a very like as he said primitive quality to it but there's always a uh, as long as the story is good I, I think people will visit them because it tells you something about that filmmaker and what drove them to move on to those larger projects 